Warning, today's episode contains comments from Rich Outfield. Welcome to hell. You have no skills and nothing to offer anybody in the world. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, here we go. Thank you for listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your host, Big Anklevich. You have never done anything for anybody, ever. And Rish Outfield. For decades, you've just been taking and sucking up education and love and food and iPods, just sucking it up and, and judging it. Yeah, it's pretty good, but not really, you know, I like that. You've just been selecting and absorbing. You've just been a burden. That's nice. Oh, that's nice. Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Episode 116. I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rich Outfield. And today's episode is not a rerun. Yet. <laughs> you butthole. So it's still October. Right. Hopefully. And, oh, yeah, good point. <laughs> the way our luck's been going. Happy December, folks. <laughs> Today's episode is... Silk for Moisture, Mud for Shine by Amanda C. Davis. Has Amanda been on the show before? I don't think so. I think this is her first appearance. Sometimes those first appearances can go up in value, like Incredible Hulk 181, worth quite a lot. First appearance, K. Bowen Black in that one. Oh, I had no idea. About the author. Amanda C. Davis is a combustion engineer with a baking habit and a taste for B-grade horror. Silk for Moisture, Mud for Shine first appeared in the Follow the Butterflies issue, Emerald Tales. You can read and listen to more stories at amandacdavis.com or follow her on Twitter at davisac1. All right, so I guess we'll uh, head off to the story. Enjoy, folks. Wait, 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 wait. wait. Uh, Who produced today's episode? Oh, today's episode was produced by Tanya Milojevic. No, seriously, how do you pronounce it? <laughs> I really don't know. I, I'm pretty sure it's something close to that. Close, unfortunately, only counts with horseshoes and hand grenades. Thanks for telling that on our show. That'll get us some repeat listeners, I bet. <laughs> Maybe we should move along to the story now. I will pummel you while the story goes. <laughs> All right, folks, enjoy the show. Silk for Moisture. Mud for Shine by Amanda C. Davis Don't be silly, said Yolanda, waving her salad fork at Amy. You're going to love them. Amy watched the sunlight glint on the fork tines. I already go to Thermabel. Yolanda lowered her sunglasses. Really, darling? And how is the treatment at Thermabel working for you, hmm? Her mocking eyes disappeared again behind the tinted lenses. Silkies can only do you good. Amy stared down at her salad. There was a piece of chicken there that looked amazing, glistening with roast juices and dressing. She hid it under a piece of lettuce. I'm happy with my spa, she said as lightly as possible. The ladies are really sweet, are they? She wrapped her lips around a cherry tomato and crushed it between her teeth, deliberately, slowly. Classic Yolanda. I'm your friend, darling, so I say this with love. They are not treating you so well. Amy swallowed down her scowl, forced her forehead smooth. So the contracts had dried up, the paparazzi lost interest, her collars become fewer and less impressive. These things went in cycles. Nobody could stay on top forever. But there were lines under her eyes she had never seen before. And all her favorite parts seemed to hang just a little bit lower. A spa's a spa. She aimed for a cucumber, then stopped herself and put her fork carefully parallel to her plate. She'd eaten enough already. Yolanda did her trick of looking over the sunglasses again. Spoken like a girl who never had a silky wrap. All right. Okay. What's so special about silkies? Now that she'd taken the bait, Yolanda shrugged. The strap of her shirt slid fetchingly down her shoulder. Oh, well, they're Brazilian, of course. The center of the world's beauty is Brazil. 
She rolled an olive around her plate idly. Full service. Everything you could want, really. And so very exclusive. Nothing sounded special so far. The silky wrap? Yolanda lit up again. That was her charm, going from cool to bright in a moment. Ah, darling, you will die. First they rub you down with flower oils from the rainforest. Very posh. Then they dust you. Dust you? Oh, yes, of course. All over. The ingredients are a secret, but I heard there are gemstones, powdered insects, crushed flower petals. Yolanda knows how to make people talk. She added with a satisfied grin. Then they wrap you up. They have long skeins of silk soaking in mud from the Amazon, just rich with nutrients, you see. And they roll it around your entire body, absolutely every inch. Like a mummy. Yolanda sighed. Please, darling, stay with me. Meanwhile, the nutrients are seeping into your skin. And then when you're wrapped and all that lovely, expensive stuff is working on your skin, they lay you in a sulfur bath. She spread her fingers wide. And your pores simply vanish. Amy wished she had the nerve to pick up her fork again. Instead, she twisted her hands on her lap. That sounds fun. Fun? This is business. We are talking about careers here. She dropped her head toward the table, and Amy leaned in to catch her words. You know who had a silky wrap? Hmm? Amy shook her head. Yolanda pointed across the restaurant patio ever so subtly to a starlet reading a magazine with her picture on the cover. Amy's jaw dropped. No. Yolanda nodded. Hand to God, darling. She was just a tiny bit overripe, yes? Not such a good year, remember? Now look at her. She could be made of bronze. For that matter, look at me. She spread her arms. Amy swallowed hard. She knew Yolanda looked better than she did. Now, forced to admire her, she faced the full awareness of how much... Yolanda smiled. Her smiles were never kind. Trust me, darling. You go into your cocoon wrapped like a caterpillar. You emerge. She spread her arms again. Amy's eyes slipped to the starlet. That particular magazine hadn't called her agent for months. A butterfly. Exactly. The concierge was small and plain, and Amy felt the familiar, unsettling roll in her stomach at being near small, plain people. He led her through silkies with a quiet description of the facilities they passed. Mud baths, hot stones, Swedish massages, French manicures. Everywhere, beautiful people in silk robes let themselves be made more perfect. Butterflies. Amy thought. Already butterflies. I want a silky wrap, she told the concierge. She said it in the haughty voice that she had modeled on Yolanda's, practicing in the mirror until it came easily. With that voice, she became straightforward and confident, accepting no rebuttals. The concierge nodded. Madame has been appraised of the cost. Her heart dipped a little. Cost had become a concern recently. But she let the facade speak for her. Is there a problem with my credit? Of course not, madame. We only try to ensure your comfort. Then give me a silky wrap, clever little man. She thought. People who worked at places like this had to be clever. Another thing that unsettled her. He bowed, ever genteel, and guided her down the hall of inlaid riverbed stone to an arched door at the very end. Please, make yourself comfortable. Uira will seat you momentarily. He bowed again. Amy watched him leave and then, feeling like she was cheapening herself somehow, opened the door on her own. A malodorous steam struck her first. Warm, rank humidity. Through her watering eyes, she spotted the bubbling yellow pool at the other end of the room. Sulfur bath. She reminded herself. She hadn't counted on the smell. She moved to the massage table and began to strip. 
Now she saw that every wall but the first was glass, fogged with steam and glittering with the trails of drops that had formed and rolled along every pane. Through the fogged glass she saw the gardens, not splendid as they had been from outside, but secret and murky, a swimming greenscape. Leaves, or were they fronds, seemed to rustle. It might have been wind or the shifting patterns of steam. The effect made her feel, contradictorily, quite exposed and very alone. She slid on the silk robe draped across the table and waited. A woman entered, another of the small plain type, with a plastic name tag reading Uida, and with her came music, wordless, woody rhythm and tinkling chimes that made no melody. Amy thought she heard the rush of waterfalls and crying birds. That's so pretty, she said, almost without thinking. Sacred music. We'll begin if you're ready. Amy took off her robe and stretched out on her stomach. Soon there were strong hands on her back and the scent of flowers. What kinds? She could never tell. Fighting back the sulfur, she closed her eyes. She'd had many massages. None had left her muscles as limp and languorous as this one. This isn't Chiatsu. She murmured into the warm and fragrant skin of her arm. No, it isn't. She offered nothing more. And Amy, woozy with pleasure, didn't ask. By the time the masseuse began dusting her limbs, Amy was almost asleep. She reluctantly sat and then stood to let the masseuse pat palmfuls of glittering dust onto her skin. Bright particles mixed with the oils and caught the light. I heard there were gemstones in this. She said to Uida, feeling sleepy and happy and beginning to get an exciting twitch of anticipation for the results. We use many natural ingredients. I heard... We got the exact recipe, madam. Oh. Glitter and oils. Silk soaked in mud. Amy let Uida wrap her head to toe. My cocoon. She said, not expecting Uida to understand. And when the cocoon came off... The door crashed open. A small woman in designer clothes stormed in. Before the door swung closed, Amy heard shouts from the hall. The woman pointed to Uira and said between clenched teeth, Give it back. The masseuse stood back from Amy, straight and proud, silk in her arms. We gave you what you wanted, madam. I know you, said Amy, feeling suddenly terribly ugly. I saw you at the cafe. The starlet looked little like she had then idly examining her own photographs. Now she was wild-eyed, disheveled. It made her more beautiful. You ruined me. I, I can't feel. I couldn't hold my nephew. He started crying, and I couldn't stand him. Madam is disturbed. Please, wait outside. I won't wait outside. I want you to give back what you stole. We stole nothing. Her face took up a stern rigidity. It changed her from a deferent servant into a terrible master. The starlet's face twisted. Her hands at her sides were fists. You took my soul! Like a tiger, she crossed the room, quick and sleek, and shoved the masseuse with both hands. Uida reeled, stumbled back. She tripped and crashed into the sunken sulfur bath. Water rolled onto the floor. Hot yellow waves closed around her. Amy shrieked. She shied away, wanting to run knowing there was no way she could be seen covered from head to toe in muddy silk. She hid her face. It was all she could do. Watch, the starlet ordered. Amy peeked through her hands. A wisp of white, screaming on its own, drifted to the ceiling and vanished. See? She darted to Amy and grabbed her by the wrist. Get out of here while you still can. Breathless with terror, Amy looked back at Uida. The masseuse groaned and rolled, groping for the marble steps, climbing out on hands and knees. On the wet tile, she raised her hands. They were smooth as a child's. Uida moaned. What have you done? Chaos descended then, in the form of three spa workers and the concierge. Amy stood petrified as someone helped Uida to her feet and hurried her away. The other two got hold of the starlet. Amy couldn't tear her eyes away. The starlet twisted in their arms. She was raving, furious. She was... She was beautiful. The concierge strode to Amy. Uh, uh, we are deeply sorry. 
he said, bowing low and rubbing his hands. Uh, there will, of course, be no charge to you. Uh, please, uh, uh, f- follow me. I will gladly show you to a place where you may uh, wash before you leave. No. The concierge tilted his head. Madame? Amy cleared her throat. <coughs> No, she said again, more loudly, in her grown-up, gorgeous Yolanda voice. I'm here for a silky wrap. Please continue. His face changed. Very well. His voice became low and smooth. We shall continue. He held out a gallant palm. She placed her hand in his. Like a queen, she let him guide her to the murky, steaming sulfur bath. Like a queen, she descended the marble steps. The water hissed against her legs. She slid deeper. The sulfur licked her chin. Amy closed her eyes. Butterfly, she thought. She took a breath and let her head slip beneath the water. Silk and mud and dust consumed her. She imagined herself gliding to the ceiling, soaring into the sky to join flocks of butterflies that were ever distant, ever beautiful, ever beloved. And now, a word about today's story. Hi, I'm Amanda C. Davis. Silk for Moisture, Mud for Shine was written in 2009 to the theme of Follow the Butterflies, In thinking about possible ways to interpret following and butterflies, I came up with conformity and metamorphosis. I put two and two together to get the beauty industry. I'm not a big fan, but it gave me a wonderfully wicked setting and inspired the kind of ending I love to write. I hope you enjoyed it, and thanks for listening. The main character, Amy was played by Tanya Milojevic. Julie Hoverson played Yolanda. Andrea Fontenot was the starlet. Big Anklevich was the concierge. Very poorly done by that guy, I might add. Rish Outfield was the narrator. And Wendy Cooper played Uira. You're kidding me. Lil Wendy Cooper? That's right. That's neat. Little Annie Adderall has grown <laughs> up, and now she is voicing Uyira. Uh, I gotta say, let me just interrupt. Don't was, you interrupt me. I'll oh. do whatever I want, woman. That was the second most difficult character name that we've ever had on the show. Uyira. Yeah. For me. I just, every single time, and I ooh, I winced in listening to it every <laughs> time I said, Uyira said, because it just, it didn't sound natural to me. Huh. What was the number one worst? Uh, feeling. <laughs> there was a story. What was it called? Verses on St. Andrews. Yeah, they did have a character named Feeling. That's difficult to say. A boy named Feeling. <laughs> a boy named Sue. Good night, everybody. <laughs> Thanks for listening. I've been rich out here. Uh, this was the second episode that Tanya... See, I want to say Tanja. Right. I know that's wrong. But it reminds me of Maja. Yeah. And it does have a J in it, so you could get away with saying Tanja. I'm sure somebody somewhere has called her Tanja before. No. But they didn't live to... No? Never. I can't believe that. Oh. Well, then I don't want to be the first. Wait, sarcasm is the uh, lowest form of wit? Somebody did say that to me recently. That Apparently that's a saying in Britain. You know what's a saying here? Yeah? Little baby fish mouth. <laughs> just, just sweeping baby the nation. Baby fish mouth is sweeping the nation? Wow. Oh, sorry. I, did I blow that? You had a chance to be a real podcaster and, and you I blew it. it. We're bringing back all the hits, folks. <laughs> it's like any album Billy Joel has put out in the last 15 years. There you go. So uh, the, the other story that Tanya produced <laughs> for us was the one about P. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, it was uh, Jason Sanford's uh, Peacemaker, Peacemaker, Little Bo Peep. I think that one was probably a lot more involved than this one was. This one was a much shorter story at, at the very least. Less um, gunplay in this yes. one. Yes. How do we determine when our episodes air? What inspired you to put this one here at the end of October? Early December. 
<laughs> Mostly it's just, you know, they come into us and I put them in a list and they just kind of run in the order that we accept them. Here and there, like in this case, as we were coming close to October, I thought, you know, we always try and run scary stories in October. So maybe I had ought to set a few aside for that particular purpose. And we happened to get a couple at that time that I was thinking about it that would work as, as scary, creepy stories. And so I moved them up in the uh, order of appearance. There's some other stories that we've got that we've had waiting for much longer than these that have had to take the back seat for a month while uh, all the horror stories pack to the front and say, hey, look at me. And of course, there is the one story that I volunteered to edit which is taking the back seat until next year sometime. Right, yeah, it just goes back and back and back, 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 way back. It's out of here. And the Mets have won the pennant. <laughs> Anyhow. Mets don't win pennants. I know, I just, I figured that it would be nice to say, to give the Mets a... <laughs> the story, it's not traditionally scary. It's not tra a traditional horror story. Right, yeah, there's not jump out from the bushes scary guy with a mask on in this story or a monster per se per se but there is something horrific horrible about the story it's a different kind of horror and and then the ending <sighs> see it's funny when i first read this story I sort of had a feeling that I wasn't going to want to, to run it on the show because it was mostly female characters right. told from a female point of view, and I felt like it was going in a certain direction. And I mean, I, I thought that there would be a nasty surprise at the end of what was going on at this day spa, you know, what their ingredients were or something like that. And I was like, well... If you would find out what Soylent Green was. And yeah, it was it was exactly like that. You know, it's like, okay, wait, if the, the reveal is unpleasant enough or disturbing enough or whatever, maybe I'll, I'll take it. Then the story took a different turn and it didn't have one of those, oh dear God, what have you been putting on your face kind of things. It was more of a, what kind of a person is our main character kind mm -hmm. of ending. And... That stuck with me uh, afterward where I just thought about it and I was like, geez, what does that say about this person? And, and what about somebody who's listening and relates to that character? And, you know, it, it, just, it just made me think. And suddenly I asked myself if I was given this option, you know, if somebody came to me and said you can have a Parsec award, but <laughs> it's going to cost you, you know, what would my answer be? And You'll like surely you're like, never get a Parsec award, but someday, Rish, I predict you'll receive some type of honor for all your hard work in the field of wasting other people's valuable time. Thank you, I think. That, was that a compliment or was he insulting me? <laughs> no. It was a backhanded compliment. You're going to get an award out of it, and that's always good, right? I'm told. <laughs> Do you think you might sell your soul for a Parsec or just Wendy Cooper's soul? Oh, uh, see, that's mean. I don't want to say that. Jeez, Wendy Cooper did a voice on this she show. She did do a voice on this show. What? And you sold her out. Wait, no. Did I sell her soul? No, I, I think, think I took it back in the end. Yeah. I don't know. There are certain kinds of stories that are parables, I guess. Or stories of... It is sort of a deal with the devil kind of thing. Right. That are meant to either upset you or make you think, what would I do in that situation? And I don't honestly know what I would do. There have been moments in my life of weakness where, you know, it's, it's good that I didn't have my heart's desire in that moment. Good that there wasn't a contract to sign right there in front of you because you may well have just put your name on the dotted line. Well, see, I'm a weak person. And if somebody came to me and said, you know, you can be everything that you've wanted to be. All the areas in which you fall short, we'll fix. And you will be like the perfect version of you. You'll be better than you. Better than you'd ever imagine you could be. And all it will take is just this little thing. I hope that that never is placed before me. Because I know myself and I know my weaknesses. 
and to be A, B, and C, these A, B, and Cs that I've always had outside my reach, things that I've wanted forever and never have been able to get, or things that I've wanted to be forever and never could be. There's very little ooh, that I would draw the line at trading. And so that kind of makes me a monster as well. You know, this, this character. Amy. I don't know. Having lived in Los Angeles and seen these beautiful girls, these perfect girls that came from, the, well, it's always Wisconsin. You know that, right? They always come from Wisconsin. They were the prettiest girl in their town. And then they came to L.A., and, you know, some of them make it and some of them don't, but they're, they're used to being seen a certain way. And then suddenly they're on a runway with 11 other girls that look as good as them. Or they're waitressing gorgeous model level chicks serving drinks at a Hooters or <laughs> some coffee house. There or... was a girl that was model level gorgeous that worked at Subway just around the corner from where I lived. And my buddy Matthew and I would go there and just look at her. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, we would order a foot long. With your pants around your with ankles. With our pants around our ankles. We would order our food and then just sit with our chairs angled so that we could just look at her. And one day she wasn't there anymore. And a little part of us died. But also we were just like somebody. In your case, a very little part. Oh, look what you did there, sir. Uh, our theory was like the right person came in. Somebody that worked at Fox or something just came in, saw her, and was like, I'm going to take her away from all this. Or else it was that serial killer that lived down the street finally came in. Because they, they pretty much have either – those are the two ends that they can possibly come to from what uh, I've come to learn from all the TV movies that I've seen. Yeah, I, I guess. I, the funny thing is the, this, the big city – is a place that hardens people. And, you, you know, you see this girl that's fresh off the boat, if you will. I think they're fresh off the bus. And they're sweet and nice and pleasant and generous. And then you'll see the ones that have been in the system, that have been part of it. I did an episode of CSI where a model was poisoned or, you know, somebody put something in her drink and, that, and they had all these girls that were playing models, you know, like fashion models or what, what do they call? And not supermodel, but, you know, like a runway model kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And at lunch, I remember I, I, I approached one of these girls because you know how I am. I approached her during lunch and I asked, are all of you really models or are you just actresses playing models? And she didn't even answer my question. She went, uh, and walked away. And I was like, oh, Dude, what a bitch, Warning, today's man. episode contains the B word. Like, wow. I wasn't hitting on her or anything like that. I just, there were all these girls that were models and they knew how to walk on, up and down the catwalk. Mm -hmm. Is that what they call it? It is. They do their little turn on the catwalk. No singing, Big Anklevich. <laughs> Sorry, announcer. I didn't actually sing. I just spoke the song lyrics that's okay right oh hell no <laughs> i think he and i are on the same page on this one uh, anyhow i was just like wow that was uncalled for i yeah uh, you know i i got used to being treated in that way because there's a hierarchy in life and the pretty girl is way up there on the hierarchy but in la these pretty girls are told day and night, you know, that they're better than the other pretty girls, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know why I'm telling you things that you already know. <laughs> it was just like, wow, what a nasty <laughs> is basically what I was thinking. Warning, today's episode contains the C word. Uh, sorry, I, I will never say cucumber again. Well, announcer man is always a day late and a dollar <laughs> short with the stupid warnings. Thanks for making sure nobody heard that. Maybe 080T will edit that out. Yes, Big Anklavich, I'll get right on that. Those listening to the finished show at home can see that it has been edited out. Thank you, R-O-8-O-T. But uh, unfortunately, that has derailed me. Um, okay, we'll take you back to where you were. C-word. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. They're just, they're, there are some nasty people out there. And I, I have a bias because, you know, I've been on the receiving end kind of thing. But, okay, let's say... 
that I, I, I'm given the option to switch places with her. I'd do it in a friggin' second. To be one of the beautiful people, to be, uh, you know, I don't know that they're powerful, but it's certainly well-to-do. I mean, th th these beautiful girls were paid 50 times what we were paid, you know. Mm -hmm. They weren't even, you know, the name actresses. These, these, these chicks, if you're lucky, their name will show up for a quarter of a second squished on the side of the end credits <laughs> while a promo for whatever's coming up next takes up 90% of the screen. Right. But still, you know, there's a hierarchy. None of our names will ever be in that episode of CSI. I don't know. I remember there was one day that I went to work on one of the Spider-Man movies and they were full up. My spot had been given to somebody else, even though my wardrobe was right there on the rack. And uh, I said, it's just right there. It's got my name on it. I, I'm supposed to be here. Natasha. You know, it's just that I was supposed to do a movie that went over and so, you know, there was a mix-up and I didn't get scheduled to this and you gave my spot to somebody else. So I was there on spec, basically. And there was a dark-haired girl, just beautiful, that was there at the same time. Yeah, I was just begging these people. And, you know, it's like, right there, I've been here. I've, I've, I'm, I'm, right, I'm part of this. Please let me. I love Spider-Man more than you know. And all this girl, this dark-haired girl did was leaned over a little bit. And says, well, if you can find a way to fit me in, I'd appreciate it. And like a half hour later, the AD came out and said, we got a spot for you to the girl and told me to go home. <laughs> and it sucked because this was one of those, if you wanted to be on the set, you had to be there at 5.30 a.m. I was there at 5.30. I so wanted to do this Spider-Man gig. And I was given the boot and this, this chick who was... Gorgeous, dude. I mean, I would have given her the food out of my mouth. <laughs> well, every extra on Spider-Man was gorgeous. Or was that Spider-Man 2? Was, that was it Spider-Man 2? That was Spider-Man 2, from? where they were all gorgeous. But they're all gorgeous until they come snarling after your trust fund. <laughs> you know, I, I'm talking and talking. I'm going to let you, because you have a whole different set of life experiences, talk. When I went to the movie and i said can you fit me in and they just let me right in it was uh, no <laughs> yeah it's interesting that whole thing i mean this story is all about somebody who would sell their soul to not look old i guess and and not even just sell their soul but like that the starlet comes in and says her nephew won't even like let her hold him because it freaks him out too much or is whatever. that what it was he cries thought, that's better than what i thought it was I, what i thought it was was just that she held him and she didn't feel anything she couldn't feel affection anymore or whatever her senses had been so deadened but i like the idea that a little baby knows what she is yeah a little baby could tell that she was a soulless monster and didn't want to be around her was scared of her yeah i don't know i mean that that gives you an idea of what they have to go through. I mean, this this person, our main character, is willing to give up on love, for, you know, and, and all that kind of stuff that you can have if you have a soul, I guess, just to look nice, to always be on the cover of the magazine. And I wonder if there would be anything that I would be willing to... Because there's, you know, I mean, that's a lot of stuff to give up. Is there something that I would care about that much that I would be willing to sell my soul, which would result in this kind of stuff? Like my kids would be like, mm, I don't like your dad anymore. They want to even more than they already do. Yeah, sit on the other side of the couch or, you know, I come into the room to watch TV and they'll get up and leave because they're creeped out every time I come around. I mean, you already get that feeling all the time. But yes, to, but to have to live like I do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for me, that would be hard to deal with. Uh <laughs> But, uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, is beauty something that's worth it? Like you said, it gets you a, a lot of places, at least in the movie business, in Hollywood. Oh, everywhere, dude. Everywhere. You know that the pretty girl is hired before the ugly girl, even at McDonald's. Probably. Or the door is opened and, oh, a taxi. Well, we'll stop for the pretty girl with the long legs. Yeah. Sometimes that can uh, backfire. I think pretty girls are also the ones that are used to having things handed to them. Rather than having to work hard for yeah, it. That's, that and, does suck. And when you get somebody like that in a real job, 
that can become quite a pain in the butt. And, and after probably one or two experiences like that, the person doing the hiring might learn their lesson and uh, not necessarily go for that. But yeah, I don't know. It, it's funny working in news. Uh, there's lots of pretty girls that uh, want to go into that, be reporters, be anchors. And they don't have to pay their dues. The anchor is put in front of the table because she fits a certain demographic or she attracts a certain demographic. We want young people to watch our news. So if we've got a girl with great big eyes, eyes, thank you, that <laughs> that we she can tell us about the plane crash with a gleam in her eye. <laughs> That she's going to be given it, whereas these ugly women, these these older women or whatever they are, they have to scrabble, they have to work, they have to edit their own package, they have to <laughs> present these things. And of course, you're more than willing to bend over backwards and help the pretty anchor too, right? I don't know. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have been talking about news. You talk. <laughs> I'm just a nice guy. I'll help anybody. You know me. Come on. Did um, you hear the one about the wannabe starlet that was so dumb she slept with the writer. <laughs> <laughs> That's the problem with wannabe starlets. They have a tendency to be dumb. Well, I, you know, I used to talk about my uncle's child bride mm -hmm. and how dumb she was. And part of it was th th that it was a, an act that she'd put on because nobody could be that dumb. <laughs> nobody could. You wouldn't be able to function. You would still be in third grade at 20 if you were as dumb as she acts. But it's considered cute or it's an easy way. It's like baby talk or something like that to get people to do things for her or to, to feel like they... And you know what? A man wants to feel needed and wants to feel useful and all that. And to have a girl is like, hey, I can't open this. A man's like, oh, I will open it for you, Tess. And, you know, she'd do things like that. And I'd just be like, come on, man. Because... She's not my wife, and she's married to my uncle, so, you know, she's out of the prospective pool or whatever. You know, all the cuteness is gone. <laughs> it's just grating to me. And I know I've told stories about her because I talked about them moving into a haunted house or a crime scene, at least. But to me, it's just, it gets old really fast. And maybe if she's your wife, it doesn't get old because, no, it's got to get old. I know it gets old because sometimes he comes over and he just walked from his house. And he's like, no, just had to get away. Like, <laughs> like how far did you walk? And he's like, just needed some fresh air. Just had to get away from someone. And I was like, oh, okay. You know, they're, they're just the frustration level or whatever. He has to get away. And uh, it's a trade-off, I guess. You marry a, a child who's never had to really be an adult always had things done for them. She's from money. And yeah, she's attractive. So there's your trade-off, you know. She's useless, but she's <laughs> very attractive. And he's old enough, you know. He's twice her age where he knew what he was getting when he signed on. And it, to him, it was worth it. It's like, I'm 21 years older than her, whatever it is, but she's hot. And people are always going to look at me with her on my arm and say, wow. He bagged that hot blonde. He must be really rich. <laughs> yeah, or, or you know, or smooth, or or, or uh, he must have it going on. You no, know, it's a trophy wife kind of thing, and and you know maybe that's a mean thing to say. Maybe I I will burn in hell for all of these things that I've said, but it's something noticeable. And you know, I'm not that much younger than my uncle. Give me a, a decade or so, and I could, and the same choice is laid before me. Maybe you'll find that stupid starlet that will sleep with the writer. <laughs> yeah, oh, there you go. <laughs> I, I have always liked that joke because it, it's mean, but it also says something about Hollywood, too. What What would be something that you might consider selling your soul for? Is it being a, a writer that writes, you know, that working in film, being the, the guy in charge of the movie that uh, you want to have made or something else? What, what would you actually consider doing this, getting a silky for <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, there's actually more than one thing. I, I, I think I was hinting at it before. I don't want to spell it out because it will make me seem shallow or make me seem like a loser or a lonely or, or whatever it is. 
Well, it doesn't necessarily um, have to be something that you would. And maybe you wouldn't actually do this for anything, but something that would tempt you. If the devil appeared before you and said, get a silky and you can have a million dollars. Uh, money isn't that big a deal for me, but uh, I don't have the responsibilities. I don't have the dependence that you do mm-hmm. that make money more important. But you can do things with money, right? Right. You no, could no, make just, your own movie if you wanted to, I, if you had... I'm just saying that that's not one of those where it's like money is the first thing that comes to my mind. Okay. But... Uh, if the genie appeared and said, you can have one wish, and you can't wish for more wishes, what would you consider? Would it be fulfilling your dreams, being a writer that you've uh, wanted to be? Would, is that something that you care about even? I mean, we've talked before about, you know, you write stuff, but you don't necessarily care to submit it places because you're fine with just having it in your computer there for someday you'll die and they can publish it all with like Emily Dickinson or something. I, I don't know. It's to me, it's a personal question. So I'm trying to deflect it. Oh, okay. I do enjoy writing for writing's sake. It is a fun, fulfilling activity. Uh huh. And there have been lots of stories that nobody's ever read uh-huh. that maybe nobody will ever read. And I'm still proud of those, or I still am glad I wrote them. That's your erotica collection? (laughs) My Care (laughs) Bear-centric slash fiction. Care Bear fanfic. (laughs) Yes. But, you know, we talk about it a lot with movies. We were just talking in a That Gets My Goat about the Terminator franchise. And does somebody that has passion for the project outweigh somebody who's a professional that's just being paid to do it and... And all that, you know, I'll see stuff and I'll just get so frustrated and feel, and this this will sound arrogant, but who cares, that I could have done a heck of a better job. Oh, come on, man. Oh, that was so easy. To, you couldn't screw it up and you screwed it up. Yeah, no, that, they say that a lot about writers, that there's two ways that people tend to go. Either they read something one day and they say, wow, this is so amazingly good. I want to be a writer so that someday I could do something this good. Or they go and they see something or read something and they go, this is such crap. I could write something better than this. And I've experienced both. I would imagine you have too. Yeah. Um, So, yeah, I would like to be a professional writer in a position of authority where I could make things happen or I I could get my shot at doing one of those things. And... The reason I don't say immediately that's what I want to do, I want to be a Hollywood screenwriter, is because a lot of times they're they're powerless. Right. The guy wrote something and then the director is just like, eh. Or there's a bunch of hands in the pot, a bunch of producers or whatever that even out all of the, the peaks and valleys and bring in three other writers and it becomes crap. It becomes a ripoff of 10 other movies. It becomes Green Lantern from this summer where I wish we had seen it together so we could have pointed at this and that moment and said, oh, you know, that's from Spider-Man 2. It's like, oh, that, wow, they went way back. That's from Superman 78. This, ooh, Dark Knight. It's just the, and I don't even want to say vanilla because vanilla tastes good. (laughs) Bland, tasteless, uh, nothing special, nothing unique, nothing interesting. Why, but if you it's like be- when you go to the soda fountain and you put all the soda flavors together and you mix them all together and then you taste it and it's not good. <laughs> or you have your palette of paints and you're like, huh, what would happen if I used all, if I mixed all these together and you do that and what color comes out of it? Like poop, brown, you know, it's that kind of a thing. And I know exactly what you mean. So you would want to be like a James Cameron where he can make what he wants exactly what he wants and he can spend as much money as he wants because everybody will do what he says because he has the power to be able to keep people from turning it brown. See, I don't know. From turning I, uh, it into a suicide. That's what they call those sodas, so, right? Yeah. When you mix them all together. The thing with James Cameron is you know, he made the most successful movie of all time for its time and then you know there was so much pressure that he made nothing for like 12 years then he made it again you know that kind of thing there's probably a downside to everything there's definitely a downside to success and you know I remember people talking about how crappy the dialogue was in Titanic how crappy James Cameron is at writing dialogue 
that they attacked Avatar and things like that for the writing and for the, the hackneyed premise and for the attention paid to special effects rather than story or character or, or whatever, fill in the blank, the uninspired James Horner score, which is all Cameron's fault. And, 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 that, and so there's a downside to that, to being the big man on the very top of the pyramid and, uh-huh. and all that. I, I, I don't want to be James Cameron. I want to be somebody like somebody that at Hammer Films in, in the 60s or like Roger Corman when he, you know, just to be able to make little things that make enough money that you could make more and just to be okay. able to, you know what, if, if I could be anything, I would want to be Rod Serling. They had in the 21st century on the CW or UPN, a third version of the twilight zone that only lasted a season. And it was all the colors mixed together to make a crappy Brown. <laughs> it was one of the most infuriating, uneven, awful shows I've ever seen. And, and I'm being harder on it than I am on other pieces of crap shows because I was so into that show. Please be good. This is what I would want to do. I want to work on this show. I want to write for the Twilight Zone. That's what I want to do. And oh, they squandered it. Except for the first episode, every episode was pap, man. It was this crap written because they thought that the audience, the target audience, the people that watch UPN are urban teenagers and girls. And and so you'd see them pull their punches and turn a really cool Twilight Zone premise into something to pat out Barbie commercials. And, and, and it would just, <laughs> oh, it, it made me so angry. It was such a betrayal of what Rod Serling did. Where he created a show so cutting edge that it's powerful today, 50 years later. And I know I talk about the Twilight Zone a lot, but who cares? I mean, that is a seminal, that is one of my influences, the the, the chief shows that's just like, oh my gosh, that opened up my eyes to what storytelling could be like. And because I'm not a, a reader, I'm a watcher, that was, you know, my exposure to that kind of storytelling. And, mm-hmm. And that's what I would want to do. It's like, and I get, you know, it's not a writer on the Twilight Zone. Although the old Twilight Zones, the Serling ones, the writer was king. You know, he would fight for whatever Richard Matheson had written or whatever it happened to be. Uh, and today, you know, as the executive producer, it's the showrunner that's king. And so, you know, to be somebody like that would be really neat. But Or just to be a, a writer for a show that you liked for a showrunner that respected the word on the page that would be really, really cool. And, you know, I, I don't know why I'm still talking about that. Oh, I guess you're granting my wishes. <laughs> yes. Bing! And so you shall. Well, thank you, sir. <laughs> I don't know. There's a cloud to every silver lining. Because let's suppose that I had that and all my dreams came true and nobody watched it. Or let's suppose I had that and all my dreams came true and it was a hit show and suddenly blowjobs left and right. And I realized that I didn't earn it. Right. I didn't work to get there or, you know what I mean? All these other people sleeping in their cars and all this stuff, you know, I just sold my soul to the devil to get it, you know? (laughs) Yeah, that's uh, something I was thinking. You never asked me the question back what I would sell my soul for. I don't think it would have to be anything all that grand. The thing that I would really think is what I want to, because then when you're done, you can't sit back and say, wow, look what I did. I did this. Isn't that cool? It's kind of like I, I I got fat between the time that, uh, you know. You were born and died. Yeah. Right. Now, between the time, I, I would say back when I was in college, I wasn't especially fat. I probably weighed 220 or so. But about a year or two ago, I weighed almost 300, like 295, just short of going over 300. In the last couple of years, I've been working on that. I've been working out and, and so forth, and I've lost a lot of that weight, and I've replaced some of that weight that was fat with weight that is muscle. And I can now look at myself and say, look what I did. I, I'm not so fat as I once was. And it's something that I can feel good about. And like we talked, I guess we talked on the, That Gets My Goat, so nobody heard us talk about it, but we talked about the goal that I did last September where... I wrote every day 500 words a day for the whole month. And when I was done, I could say, wow, look what I did. I'm going to give up again. I mean, <laughs> Inspiring story, sir. <laughs> but I could say, look what I did. And, and that was me getting better. And with writing, just like with fitness, it's something that you have to do every day to get better. 
I guess I'm going to have to start my goal again next month because I never did do the submitting. But, you know, that's part of it is submitting the stories that you write. And you get better and you progress and you learn. And when you're done, you can say, yeah, look what I did. Maybe the one thing that I might ask for is just more time because getting close to being freaking 40 years old. Um, Big Anklevich, so pathetic it'd be funny if it wasn't so sad. Sometimes I think, boy, I wish I could go back and tell myself when I was a teenager, hey, you're going to want to be a writer for the rest of your life. Why don't you start writing now? And Instead you're like, of saying, F you, old man. I got this girl in the back of the car. There's not room for two of us back here. Instead of saying September of 2011, why don't you start writing? You say, why don't you start writing your 500 words a day now while you're young enough that you can, you know, have figured this stuff out before you're an old fart? That might be something, but I wouldn't want to sell my soul for that <laughs> necessarily. But if there was something I might want, maybe it's that be able to go back and have more time to work at it so that I would know what I was doing before I was too friggin' old to do anything with it. There, uh, this is kind of a tangent, and if it's too offensive, I'll have Robot cut it out. There was a girl at work who was enormously fat, just uh, unhealthily so, just a really, really big person. Mm-hmm. Um, and she was mean, you know, kind of unpleasant person and I worked with her and she bit my head off a few times not literally (laughs) she was really hungry she was she uh one time I was talking with my friend and I and I was said has and see I'm tiptoeing let me just you know if 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 this is an offensive thing I'm saying or if you know whatever I I apologize in advance but you know this is what it is and so it's a story. Oh, gosh, that's something I hate when people say it is what it is. What does that mean? It is what it is. <laughs> oh, I, I want to smack that. I'd trade my soul for yeah. to, to be able Chance to smack, to smack everybody that says that. That says that. I, I, I talked to my friend and I said, is it that she's unattractive and life has made her unpleasant and hateful? Or if she were beautiful, would she still be this way? And we didn't know. You know, there's no knowing. There's a parallel universe out there like we talked about last week. But one day she didn't come to work and she didn't come to work for four weeks or five weeks or something like that. And she had gotten her stomach stapled. She got a a procedure done to limit her intake of food or, 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 or what, you, know, you know how a stomach stapling mm-hmm. works. Yeah, we've heard of it to, to prevent her from being so large. And again, I'm tiptoeing, but you, you know what I'm saying. And she came back to work after four weeks or five weeks or whatever, and she looked like a different person. This is the kind of thing that the women will hate quit the show about. Rage quit? And I just hate them. Um, <laughs> and she looked like a different person. Uh huh. And suddenly she started going to... The work activities and, and, you know, a bunch of people are getting together at so-and-so bar after work. And she started to come and participate. Mm -hmm. And she was awful. What an awful, awful person. She suddenly had an influx of confidence because of the way her physicality had changed. And so she was more outspoken of what your defect is or what your problem is or what a crappy employee you are. And also her confidence made her molest both me and Matthew one night. Um, she became promiscuous also. It was, it was just something strange because the only way to know what she would have been like was through this parallel universe. But through the miracle of modern science, suddenly Matthew and I found out what she was like. And she was no different. She was an awful person, a worse person mm-hmm. when she was thinner because she never got rail thin or, or supermodel-esque or anything like that. She just, you know, she carried herself differently and, and she got to have sex with people if they would go home with her. And it just, it was weird and it was upsetting to me because I had given her the benefit of the doubt during this time. That's like, you know what? Life has been unkind to her, of course she's unkind. And I just felt like 
had she been dealt a different deck, she would be a different person. And, and, and okay, so I, I don't know. Off the record, what do you think? Should I have left that in? Is that something to be put in the outtakes? I think it's fine. It's not a big deal. You were talking about losing all that weight and becoming muscular and all that. But what if <laughs> there was a pill you could take and tomorrow you'd wake up and you'd be two. 30 or, or whatever the optimum I don't know what the optimum weight for you is but you'd be all muscular and you'd be all square jawed like you are and, <laughs> and stuff like that you'd take it right? It probably I don't know it depends on the uh, loss of the soul involved <laughs> with not, the pill or is this just I'm not saying that you're going to trade your soul it's just that it's conceivable you, you'll always see these commercials right. for take this magic pill no diet no exercise necessary eat as much as you want pig out and you'll lose right. all your weight in fact your tits will get bigger and you're just like how could this possibly be real I say, wait I don't want big tits that's actually not a good thing for a guy well there's these miracle diets <laughs> <laughs> these 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 scams or these too good to be true kind of things but eventually science is going to perfect a pill that you pop into your stomach or well into your mouth and swallow and after a month you're svelte right it's it's going to happen because that's a multi that's a potentially trillion dollar industry right there you know there was a story that Cory Doctorow wrote and i want to say it was called Onzord <laughs> With a zero for all the O's. Okay, you know what? We're never going to have Corey on the show again for a reason. But the story was really interesting because it's about this guy who's a programmer and he's working on some kind of a government thing and somehow they find a way to get into your brain's programming and they take all the stuff that's involuntary... You know, the the various things that your body does that are involuntary. And he says, you know what? Screw this. These don't need to be involuntary. Let's make them voluntary so I can use my brain to make my body do what I want it to do. Like digestion and things like that? Heartbeat? Right. Like digestion and heartbeat. And, and you know, the, they go over the thing and say, wow, God. the reason it's involuntary is because, you know, it's too much to think about. And he's like, well, I voluntarily move my arm up and down. Imagine how complex it is to get all those muscles to do all the things that they do so that I can move my arm where I want it to go. If my brain can figure that out and do that voluntarily, then why can't I make my heart beat or whatever? And what he winds up doing is he goes through and he programs his metabolism with his brain and he turns his body from a fat programmer body into this amazing, you know, svelte buffed kind of dude and all that and it was just a really interesting thing and you know he did that just by reprogramming himself you know that same kind of thing you're talking about the you take the pill the magic pill and suddenly you're perfect you're you're amazing you're exactly what uh, the ideal human should be or whatever and yeah maybe someday that'll that'll happen and that'll come up it seems like it's more needed now than ever because yeah it's it seems to be getting much more prevalent because food that makes you fat is so much more available than it ever was and going out and doing stuff is less attractive than it ever was i mean shoot there's video games and there's tv and there's computers so you know why are you going to go out and do something that involves exercising but the the feeling of pride you had when you lost that weight this fall, you wouldn't have that. That's true. Yeah, I mean, you wouldn't get that feeling. Okay, let's let's so, turn it to the other subject, which is writing. I have here in my hand a pill. <laughs> no, seriously, I have a pill, and it will wake you up for an hour every night. Your body will continue to think you're asleep, but your brain will be active enough. That you will either type or handwrite for an hour using your subconscious, you know, <laughs> the, all of the education you ever had, all the words you ever heard. You'll be able to create something much better and, or easier at least uh -huh. than you ever would be consciously sitting down for an hour and trying to write. And the next morning, you can wake up when your alarm goes off and read what you've written. Who wouldn't take that? Who would <laughs> right. not... You know, if that were made available, who would not line up and say, I want it? Now, granted, there are probably people listening who don't want to be writers, who don't care about writers, you know, whatever it might be. Right. Um, if you but, could sit down to the spinning wheel and spin straw into gold real fast, would you do it? 
I think that went badly for the person that did that, though. So maybe I don't know. I th- I think that was the R- Rumpelstiltskin story. Yeah. Oh no! I think in the end they turned out okay. They didn't have to sell their firstborn child because they figured out what his name was, huh? I bet Disney could make a good Rumpelstiltskin, and you would get Mankin to write the songs. They ought to try that out. There's there's still three or four really good fairy tales that haven't been ruined by Shrek. All the Rumpelstiltskin, it has been ruined. It was he was the villain in like the fourth one. I don't know. Did people watch that? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Tangent. Okay, but we're just talking about writing now. See, I, to me, that's a that's a win win. Yeah, I don't. I know. guess it's... I've done the million words of crap that we're always talking about. So I don't want to work anymore. I f it. I just want to be able to sit down and write great stories, give them to you to sell. <laughs> you know, that's how lazy I've become. <sighs> yeah, and I, I know what you're saying. It's it, it's definitely an attractive thing, and you wonder what is more important. Is it important to turn out the good things? Is it important to be the perfect svelte person? Are you mocking me? Is that what's going on? <laughs> no, I just love that word, svelte. Okay. What kind of a word is that? Where do you think that word comes from? Is it stolen from Russian or something? I mean, an S and a V together, that just doesn't happen in English. Anyways, you know, to be that perfect person or whatever, it's, it's, it would be much easier to have the pill that would do it for you. But there's got to be something that you got to take pride in. You got to feel. We do this show. Would we feel good about getting a Parsec award if we were to ever get such a thing? If we didn't work hard on it, if we didn't try hard, if we, we didn't try to improve, we paid off the voting. <laughs> right, the judges. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, that's that's. It's hard to say. I don't. When you get handed that award after you paid off the judges. Would you feel good about having that award? Would you feel good putting it on your shelf? Is that going to matter to you? Well, this is me. No, I wouldn't. I'm, I'm, I'm much more fulfilled when somebody writes a nice comment or talks about something that we said in an episode that made them laugh. Or, uh-huh. You know, I was really disturbed by so-and-so or those photos you sent of Rish Naked really upset me. I get more satisfaction from that and also... Just because it is work and you do have that sense of accomplishment when you work hard on something. But if you work hard on something and nobody appreciates it, that sucks too. There's a lot of things that suck in the world. And, and the, the truth is nobody's ever going to have a perfect life. If you had a pill that made you smart and you had a pill that made you right and you had a pill that made you really good in bed and you had a pill that made you run fast and, they and all that stuff. a pill that makes you good in bed. It's little and blue. It doesn't make you good in bed though. I mean. The, <laughs> oh, you're right. The, Sorry. Go on. The, okay. These, these gorgeous chicks that line up to pretend to marry Hugh Hefner. Or whatever. You know what I mean? On the one hand, of course he's happy because these awesome, the, the prettiest girl in Wisconsin wants to pretend to be his woman. But at the same time, they don't love him. They don't really find him attractive. They don't really want to be with him. They have nothing in common with him. They're there for his money. They're there because he can make them famous. They're there because... They can write a tell-all book. They're there because suddenly they're center of attention. They don't give a crap about him. And I don't know, is the hot jiggling blonde on your arm worth the pain when she tells everybody, you know, what a pathetic loser you are three months later and sells that ring you gave her and makes a reality show about it? And, you know, this isn't science fiction. This actually happens with Hugh Hefner. Even if we have all these perfect things going on in life, the whole ability of life is to screw up what's good or to throw obstacles in your path or to trip you and make you fall and bring you down to earth. And, you know, if if multi-zillionaire Steve Jobs can die at 55, you know, he has all this money and yet he didn't get to live to be an old man and have his grandchildren at his feet and all that stuff. There's no such thing as, as a perfect life. There's no such thing as having it all, is there? Probably not. You have to uh, choose your battles. You have to pick what's most important to you, I guess. And you never know how things are going to go. You never know if you're going to get pancreatic cancer or something like that that's going to end it all way earlier. And uh, you know that's where the whole seize the day thing comes from. You know, Now's your chance and 
take it because you don't know what's coming. You may live to be old enough to be Hugh Hefner and have the jiggling blonde on your arm, or you may not. Yeah, I don't know. There's things that I can't ever know. What if I were that pretty girl? There may be challenges and obstacles and awful things in her life that I can never understand. That I never, it would never bother me. I would never fear. You know, so I remember we talked about it in another episode how horrible it would have to be to be that really hot chick and see your beauty start to fade, to look in the mirror and be like, oh no, the end is coming. You know, I'm not going to be able to turn every head at the next party I go to. That's something that I'll never understand. You turn every head at the party. They just turn away. (laughs) Okay. Someday maybe that'll fade. All right, then. (laughs) All right, then. I do know how that feels. There you go. (laughs) You know, I, I remember Megan Fox in an interview talking about how people treat her in Hollywood and these executives or whatever that think that they can paw her or, you know, do her. And all that because they're, ex- leg. because they're executives and because she's a pretty girl. And I just thought, well, you know, that's something that I'll never have to worry about. I mean, unless you go to prison, <laughs> you're not going to be on the receiving end of that kind of attention mm-hmm. or, you know, or unfair expectation, whatever. See, it's hard to feel sorry for Megan Fox, to me at least. Right. But she's got challenges that we won't ever understand and one day there's going to be another blue-eyed black-haired chick with just as big a boobs that's 10 years younger that's at the same audition and geez i you know i don't know I, the, the 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 main character in this story is kind of an awful person but in her shoes i don't know maybe i would I, I mean i know i'm not a great person you dangle the right carrot in front of me and I will lunge for it. Um, that's, that's me. I know me. I know my own weaknesses. And they're myriad. <laughs> but that's a different kind of horror, like we started saying at the very beginning. Of just, you know, where's your line? What is your price? Right. And uh, I don't know. These are questions that people don't want to ask themselves because the answers are ugly. The answers are frightening. And so I guess... The story is totally appropriate for the Halloween season, for a horror story, for a scary story in October. And yeah, I I don't know if we've got another one of those episodes where I need to warn people up front that it might be offensive. I've not tried to be offensive. I've just tried to tell things the way I see them in this episode. And, And hopefully it was a good episode. Hopefully it was an enlightening episode or entertaining or at least unusual. You know, I don't I don't know that where there were a ton of fart jokes or we probably farted at least once or twice, though. That may have been edited out, though, so folks may not know. I don't know. Is, is there anything else you want to say about it, or should we just let people go their I way? Think it's, I think it's time that we can let them go. I don't know. You see, uh, somebody emailed me the other day and said, well, have you ever had a guest on your show? Would you ever have a guest on your show? I think he wanted me to say, sure, come on board. But, you know, you and I have an understanding, and we have a relationship that goes back years and years, and we're able to play off each other and stuff like that. And if you brought somebody new into it, it would be different. But if we could have had maybe Tanya on the phone and done a Skype call or whatever, ask somebody that's a girl to give their point of view, to give their opinion and their life experience, it, it, that would have been enlightening maybe. And, right. and, and that's what we've got forums for or a comment section for you, not you, Big Anklevich, but you, the listener, probably have experiences that are totally relevant to this topic, to this conversation that I can't have because I've got that pesky Y chromosome. Right. Um, so, so please share those with us. Maybe uh, this story totally struck a chord with somebody or maybe, you know, it's just maybe I'm wrong. But I'm I'm curious. I, I, these are things that I'm really interested to know. You know, I'll, I'll never know what it's like to be the pretty girl, to, even in that parallel universe where somebody took a left turn. Where in reality, I took a right turn. You're I'm still I'm, not, not, a I'm still not girl. a pretty girl. Even when you got dressed up in that dress and put the bow in your hair, you still weren't a pretty girl. No, quite the contrary. So, <laughs> polka dot dress just didn't do it for you. 
but yeah, we we would definitely love to hear your uh, your comments on the uh, the whole topic and check us out. There's there's comments on the main page that you can go to, or you can join the forums and uh, leave your comment there. But we'd love to continue the discussion. It's time for us to go. It's time for us to say goodbye to all our company. But uh, yeah, drop by the forums or leave a comment on this whole discussion if you have something to say on it. We'd love to hear it and uh, continue the conversation there. Yes. So thanks for listening, folks. F U C. <laughs> K E Y. What? <laughs> Please come on back again next week, folks. And don't forget to tip your. Don't forget to donate to the show. Tip your waitresses. These poor girls came from Wisconsin. That's right. Where they were the prettiest girl in town. On a bus. And now they have to bring you your club sandwich. I I have no idea what real people eat. (laughs) (sighs) Good night, folks. See you later. Don't hate me because I'm beautiful. Real people don't eat slop. That just gets dumped into the trough like you. It's, it's a... The Dune Steve is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. It's a different world than where you come See, from. you said that crappy food is more accessible. So you can give it to anyone, but you cannot change it or make money off it. Crappy food is also better. <laughs> it tastes better. Well, there you go. <laughs> from the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine team, good night. Take two. Tanja. Tanja. Tanja of the nine fingers. <laughs> and the silk for moisture. Please make yourself comfortable. Uh, how are we saying that? You're friggin' ki- kidding me. Is Tanya gonna know that it's Uira? Oh, you know what? I don't read this character. It doesn't matter, does it? Okay. Uida will see to you momentarily. Sacred music, said Uida. Am I saying that um, awkwardly, or does it sound okay? Said Uida. We'll begin if you're ready. Amy heard shouts from the hall. The woman pointed to Uida. The woman pointed to... The woman pointed to Uida. The woman pointed to Uida and said between clenched teeth, Give it back! Okay, so I'm pointing out... He led her through silkies. Here, on the left, is the mud baths. Over here, oh, those are the hot stones. A Swedish massages. I, oh, this is the French manicures. Everywhere are beautiful people in silk robes, letting themselves be made more perfect. Yes, you like that? I thought so. Silk for moisture, mud for shine. By your mom. Hey! Bye. That's mean. I'm not going to say that. That's mean. Yeah, there's not jump out from the bushes scary guy with a mask on in this story, or a monster. You are the monster, sir.